This is a teaching by Pastor Nico Sammons from ICU God Ministries Online. Pastor Nico has started a new series on the book of Joel. And now, here is Pastor Nico Sammons as he teaches through the book of Joel. The title of this message is, The Lord Judges the Nations. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we declare that you are a good God and we declare that you are a great King. Thank you that we can study your word today. It is my prayer that your Holy Spirit will open our minds and that he will open our hearts so that we will be able to understand what you want to say to us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. In Jesus' wonderful and powerful name we pray. Amen. Now, over the years, many movies relate the title, The Final Chapter. Generally, with these words comes a sense of finality. Additionally, when we get to the final chapter in a book we are reading, we know that our reading time is short, that the complete story has been told, and if it has any kind of mystery in its plot, that mystery will be revealed. Final chapters also relay a sense of mixed emotions. Having made our way through the prophecy of Joel, we not only complete the book, but we also grasp a glimpse of end-time judgment. One of the truths about God's word seems to be that the teaching on the end of days should serve not only as a warning to us, but also as an encouragement to the people of God. Frankly, it is easy to get the sense that the forces of evil have the upper hand on earth. While this is not for the most part true, it is easy to be lulled into sensing this. The story of the end time events serves to remind us that a great day is coming when evil, that is sin, selfishness, self-economy, persecution of the saints, and many more will be destroyed with fire by our Lord Jesus. So it serves as both an encouragement for the child of God who walks with and lives for God and it also serves as a warning for those who do not walk with God. Joel 3 verse 1 says, For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, the phrase in those days and in that time refers to the time when those who call on the Lord will be saved. God will not only bless believers with everything they need, He will also bless them by destroying all evil and ending the pain and suffering on earth. This prophecy had three fulfillments, immediate, ongoing and final. Its immediate interpretation could apply to King Jehoshaphat's recent battle against several enemy nations, including Moab and Ammon. Its ongoing fulfillment could be the partial restoration of the people to their land after the exile to Babylon. The final fulfillment will come in the great battle that precedes Jesus' reign over the earth. The last battle of the world will be called Armageddon. In his book entitled, God Will Have the Last Word, A Study of the Revelation, Bobby Anderson said, It is described as the rallying place of the kings of the whole world who, led by the unclean spirits issuing from the mouth of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet, assemble year four, the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. 
Revelation promises that in the face of defeat of God's people by military forces from the east, south and the north, the Lord Jesus will return to defeat his enemies and to deliver his people. Joel 3 verse 2 says, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Notice with me, God takes an offense to that, to the dividing up of the Holy Land, His land, the land that He gave to the Jews. When Jesus returns, He will assemble the Jews from the ends of the earth and He will replant them into the land that He promised them. Then He will judge the nations of the world in the valley of Jehoshaphat. Tradition identifies this valley as the gorge, east of Jerusalem, the Kidron Valley which is between the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives. This is the valley of Jehoshaphat. The name Jehoshaphat means God has judged or whom God judges. And this is what Jesus will do in that day. You remember in Matthew 25, Jesus spoke of this judgment in the valley of Jehoshaphat. He said, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and the nations will be assembled before Him, and He will separate them as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. It is interesting to me the basis on which the separation occurs. Jesus said, it was how they treated the least of these my brethren. And who were Jesus' brethren? The church? Oh no, we are his bride and not his brethren. No, Jesus was born a Jew, thus the Jews were his brethren, his brothers. Here are how the nations will ultimately be judged by how they treated Israel, the Jews. This is what Joel says in our context. I will enter into judgment with them, there on account of my people. See, not only is Jesus' promise confirmed in the prophecy of Joel, but it harkens all the way back to God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. Remember what God told Abraham, I will bless those that bless you and I will curse those that curses you. And God will stay true to this to the very end. This is how he will judge the nations. Jesus will judge the nations on how they treated the Jews. That means woe to South Africa if we ever turn our backs on Israel. And then he says in verse 3, And they have cast lots for my people, and have given a boy for an harlot, and sold a girl for wine, that they might drink. In other words, the nations have enslaved the Jews. Look at the horrors that have happened to the Jews over the centuries. Verse 4 continues, Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coasts of Palestine? Will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? Tyre and Sidon were two major cities in Phoenicia to the northwest of Israel. Philistia was the nation southwest of Judah. Both were small countries that rejoiced at the fall of Judah and Israel because they would benefit from the increased trade. God would judge them for their wrong attitude. In Proverbs 24 verse 17 to 18, Solomon says, Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. 
lest the Lord see it and it displease him and he turn away his wrath from him. King David, Solomon's father, refused to gloat over the death of his lifelong enemy Saul. On the other hand, the nation of Edom rejoiced over Israel's defeat and was punished by God for their attitude. To gloat over others' misfortune is to make yourself the avenger and to put yourself in the place of God, who alone is the real judge of all the earth. Joel 3 verse 5 says, Because ye have taken my silver and my gold, and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things, the people of Tyre and Sidon, as well as the Philistines, not only plundered God's temple, but sold his people into slavery. Therefore, because the law of sowing and reaping is an immutable law of God, God's people would eventually be freed, while history shows that they themselves would be sold into slavery after they were conquered by Alexander the Great and the Greeks. Some think this verse and Joel 3 verse 1 indicates that Joel lived after the captivity in Babylon, 586 BC, when the Greek culture began to flourish. But archaeological studies have shown that the Greeks were trading with Phoenicia as early as 800 before Christ. Joel 3 verse 6 says, the children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. Even at this time, the children of Israel were being sold into slavery. Yet, this was before Rome had come to power. Joel 3 verse 7 says, Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them, and will return your recompense upon your own head. All these neighboring nations that had been guilty of mistreating the Jews, they are now ripe for judgment, and God will carry out it. James 4 verse 12 says, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? If you judge your brother, you disobey the law, which is putting yourself above the law and treating it with contempt. In other words, who do you think you are? When you begin to talk like that, you are moving into the position of God. In John 5 verse 22, Jesus said, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. There are many Christians today who in effect say to the Lord Jesus, you move over. I am going to help you. We are going to have a supreme court and I am going to be one of the judges. Bible students, we are to judge ourselves and to go to Jesus in humility. There are two types of people today who seek to take the position of God. One is the sinner who says, I am good enough to be saved. Lord, I don't need your salvation. You just move over and I am going to move up and sit beside you. I am my own savior. But listen, God says in his word that he is the only savior. Then there is the other fellow who sits in judgment on everyone else. He does not judge himself, but he judges everyone else. James is saying that judgment is God's business. Joel 3 verse 8 says, 
and I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off, for the Lord hath spoken it. The people of Arabia are also referred to as Sabians. They come from Sheba, a nation in southwestern Arabia. You remember in 1 Kings 10 verse 1 to 13, one of Sheba's queens had visited Solomon over a century earlier. Well, the Sabians controlled the eastern trade routes. Joel 3 verse 9 says, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. God is provoking the nations to come up against him. Imagine God is saying, go ahead, make my day. That is what he is doing. He is angry with the nations of the world and he is calling them together to the valley of Megiddo for the final battle. Joel 3 verse 10 says, Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Someone will say, I thought the Bible said to beat your swords into plowshares. Well, it does say that, but the time to do that is when Jesus' kingdom is established on the earth and he ushers in his peace. When Jesus is ruling, you can get rid of your sword, but until then, you had better keep your ammunition dry and you had better be prepared. I do not agree that we should get rid of guns today. I think we need to protect our homes, our loved ones, and our nation. Notice again what Joel says here. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Get ready for war. God's next plan on the agenda is to bring judgment on the nations of this world. This is what Paul warns about in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. When Jesus returns, we will no longer need weapons, but until then, we need to keep our powder dry and a few bombs or two on standby just for in case. There are some bad guys out there. We need to be prepared today. We are living in a bad, bad world. Joel 3 verse 11 says, Assemble yourselves, and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. As the armies assemble God's people, pray, O Lord, let your mighty ones come down. Who are the mighty ones? We are the bride of Jesus. When the world looks like it is going to be blown away to bits and pieces, they will look up and exclaim, Behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Joel 3 verse 12 says, Let the heathen be wakened, and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Remember what the Apostle John said of Jesus in Revelation 19 verse 15. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Jesus is the King and Jesus is the Judge. In Isaiah 9 verse 6, the Bible calls Jesus the Prince of Peace, and He is. Jesus will bring peace upon this earth, but only after He kills off all His enemies first. Jesus is coming as a mighty warrior with His sword drawn. 
The blood he slays of his enemies will be splattered on his robe, down his thigh, that says, King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is coming as a warrior. Then he will usher in a worldwide peace. God will crush the nations as grapes, we are told. Blood will flow like juice. Joel 3 verse 13 says, Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. In Revelation chapter 14, we see this put ye in the sickle in relationship to the battle of Armageddon. This is an image of judgment. Jesus is separating the faithful from the unfaithful like a farmer harvesting his crops. This is a time of joy for the Christians who have been persecuted and martyred. They will receive their long-awaited reward. Christians should not fear the last judgment. Jesus said in John 5 verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, have everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Joel 3 verse 14 says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Joel described multitudes waiting in the valley of decision, the valley of judgment in verses 2 and verses 12. Billions of people have lived on earth and every one of them dead, living and yet to be born will face judgment. Look around you Bible students. Maybe you have friends, colleagues, children or parents who are in the valley of decision. Those with whom you work and live. Have they received God's gracious forgiveness. Have they been warned about sin's consequences? If we understand the severity of God's final judgment, we will want to take God's offer of hope to those we know. Wage war on their behalf through prayer that they might make the right decision, that they might choose Jesus Christ as their Savior. Joel 3 verse 15 says, The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Before judgment actually bursts upon them, and in preparation for it, the sky is overcast, darkness as a warning of the approaching storm encloses them, the lights of heaven are put out. The pitchy darkness of a night in which neither moon nor stars appear is sufficiently dismal and awful. Still more terrible, if possible, is darkness in the daytime when the light of the sun is turned into blackness. Joel 3 verse 16 says, the Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Bible students, we usually picture Jesus as a lamb, but here we are told that he is a lion. He roars from Zion. In his book entitled, In His Chambers, Eric Mount says, We make our decision and then our decisions make us. And that is true. That will certainly be true in the final day. God will decide on us in accordance with the decisions that we have made in our lives. In his book entitled, 
C.S. Lewis, Five Best Books in One Volume, the author tells us that when we die, there will be God with our disguise, something so overwhelming that it will strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror into every creature. It will be too late then to choose your side. That will not be the time for choosing. It will be the time when we discover which side we have already chosen, whether we realized it or not. Now, today, this moment is our chance to choose the right side. God is holding back to give us that chance. It will not last forever. We must take it or leave it. Joel 3 verse 17 says, So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. Since 70 AD, for the last 1,952 years, Jerusalem has been trampled by gentile feet. Today, Muslim knees bow and pray on the Temple Mount. But when Jesus returns, Jerusalem and Zion will be liberated. Jesus' victory will demonstrate to his people that he is indeed Israel's covenant God and that his special place of abode is Mount Zion. After this battle, Jerusalem will truly be the holy city, set apart entirely for God's people and no longer defiled by pagan invaders. Jerusalem will be filled with people who are ruled by Jesus, submitted to Jesus and walking with the Lord Jesus. Joel 3 verse 18 says, and it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. Ezekiel chapter 47 verse 1 to 12 describes the spring that bubbles up in the temple and becomes a mighty river flowing east towards the Dead Sea. The valley of Shittim is northeast of the Dead Sea and apparently receives water from this river. The picture of this restored land is one of perfect beauty, similar to the Garden of Eden. The life-giving fountain flowing from the Lord's temple illustrates the blessings that come from God. Those who trust in Him will be forever fruitful. The Valley of Shittim was a place associated with both failure and success, failure and victory. It was where the king of Moab sent his young women to the men of Israel to seduce them into idolatry and sexual immorality. See Numbers chapter 25. It was also the launching place for the armies of Israel when they set out against Jericho and Canaan in the days of Joshua. When water from the house of the Lord flows down to the valley of Shittim, then God's grace and provision covers the past for every sin and victory. The picture here is the picture of abundance of vineyards and flocks and refreshments that will characterize the millennium. When Jesus, the Prince of Peace, rules and reigns in Jerusalem. Joel 3 verse 19 says, Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. 
Egypt and Edom were two of Israel's most persistent enemies. God will judge Egypt even into the millennial kingdom. Why? For they have always been enemies of the nation of Israel. Joel says they will become deserts because they shed innocent blood. Presumably the blood of God's people. They also represent all the nations hostile to God's people. God promised that they would be destroyed and it is also a promise that all evil in the world will one day be dealt with and be destroyed. Joel 3 verse 20 says, But Judah shall dwell forever and Jerusalem from generation to generation. Judah and Jerusalem, on the other hand, would be full of people for all generations to come. The word Judah is used here to refer to all God's people. Anyone who has called on the name of the Lord. There is full assurance of victory and peace for those who trust in God. Joel began with a prophecy about the destruction of the land and ended with a prophecy about its restoration. He began by stressing the need for repentance and ended with the promise of forgiveness that repentance brings. Joel was trying to convince the people to wake up to get rid of their contentment and realize the danger of living apart from God. The chapter closes. Joel 3 verse 21 says, For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. Jesus does not dwell in Zion today. Jerusalem is as pagan and heathen as any city on top side of planet earth. But the day is coming when the Lord Jesus will dwell there. Then we will see all these things fulfilled. Listen Bible students, we would need to see Jesus himself there to say that these things are being fulfilled today. But that is not where we see him. For at this very moment, he is at God's right hand. It is my prayer that we might be continually conscious of him and have the reality of his presence in our lives. What are the lessons that we can learn from this Bible study? Number one. The greatest cruelty today is cruelty toward children. It is one of the most appalling things that is happening in our day. I read some time ago of a mother who cohabited with some no good, never do well man who beat her little boy. A precious little boy. What a beautiful child he was at the beginning. But they also showed a picture of him near the end. He had been beaten and mistreated and finally killed by that man. There was not much protest over that. Such cruelty toward children is one of the signs of the end of an age. Why are so many children running away from home in this day? I think any parent who has a runaway child needs to get down on their knees before God and ask Him what they have done wrong. Someone will say, well, the child got in with the wrong crowd. We need the help of a psychologist. Bible students, we don't need that. We need to read the word of God. God says the evil day will come when they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for an harlot. How many fathers today are setting the right example for their sons and sold a girl for wine that they might drink? How many girls are being plunged into immorality because of liquor in their homes? 
One young girl who had become a harlot and was arrested was asked where she first took her first drink. She said that it had been with her mother. God have mercy on a mother who would do a thing like that. Someone needs to speak out today in the so-called polished and sophisticated age that wants to think we are advancing in civilization. Number two. In Proverbs 24 verse 17 to 18, Solomon says, Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth, lest the Lord see it and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. When you hear that something bad has happened to someone you haven't really liked very much, don't you say, I am glad that happened to him or her. Now, don't tell me you have never said that, because human nature is like that. If you haven't said it, you have thought it. God says, Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth. That is not the way to solve the problem. Why? If we rejoice when your enemy falls, the Lord may turn around and start prospering that man or that woman. Then you will really be miserable. So there is a very practical reason for not rejoicing when your enemy falls. Number three. In Galatians 6 verse 7, Paul declares, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It would certainly be a surprise if you planted corn and potatoes came up. It is a natural law to harvest what we plant. It is true in other areas too. If you gossip about your friend, you will lose their friendship. Every action has results. If you plant to please your own desires, you will harvest a crop of sorrow and evil. If you plant to please God, however, you will harvest joy and everlasting life. What kind of seeds are you planting? Number 4. James 4 verse 12 says, There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Jesus summarized the law as love for God and love for our neighbor. And Paul said that love demonstrated toward a neighbor would fully satisfy the law of God. When we fail to love, we are actually breaking God's law. Examine your attitude and examine your actions toward others. Do you build people up or tear them down? When you are ready to criticize someone, remember God's law of love and say something good instead. Saying something beneficial to others will cure you of finding fault and increase your ability to obey God's law of love. Number 5. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1 to 3, Paul says, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. All efforts to determine the date of Jesus' return are foolish. Don't be misled by anyone who claims to know. We are told here that no one knows and that even believers will be surprised. The Lord will return suddenly and unexpectedly, warns Paul. So be ready. 
Because no one knows when Jesus will come back to earth, we should be prepared at all times. Suppose he were to return today. How would he find you living? Are you ready to meet him? Live each day prepared to welcome Jesus. Number six. The idea of the Valley of Decision has been used in countless evangelistic meetings to show people that they stand in the Valley of Decision and must decide for or against Jesus. Joel's context is exactly the opposite. Man does indeed stand in the valley of decision, but it is God who does the deciding, not man. It is a valley of judgment and we should decide for Jesus right now, so we never stand in this valley of decision. Number 7. Joel's message to us is that there is still time. Anyone who calls on Jesus' name can be saved. Those who turn to Jesus will enjoy the blessings mentioned in Joel's prophecy. Those who refuse will sadly face destruction and judgment. God always has the final say and God will always have the last voice. Amen. I want to conclude Joel part 6 with this thought. Jesus died on the cross of Calvary to set you free and to give you hope for your future. He will forgive your sins, hand them over to Him. Now is the time to make a decision to follow and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have any questions or would like someone to pray with you, we would be happy to speak with you. Please give us a call at 082 828 2085. We are so excited for your new life in Christ. And there we have the book of Joel. Be blessed and be safe in Jesus' name.